Cold cases, missing persons, unsolved crimes. This is a Monday Night Mystery with Mitch McCoy. Hello and welcome in to Monday Night Mystery. We are live seeking answers into the 1981 cold case murder of a North Little Rock woman, Marcia King, found strangled to death on the side of a road in Miami County, uh, Miami County, Ohio. The groundbreaking technology experts used to ID her and where the case stands as detectives hunt a cold blooded killer. Welcome into Monday Night Mystery. I'm Mitch McCoy. Glad to have you with us. We are streaming live across all of our digital platforms tonight. You can use the hashtag Monday Night Mystery right here on Facebook Live and we will try and get your questions answered. But I want to get to our uh, panel tonight. We have Sergeant Thomas Cole, a major crimes detective. We also have former Pulaski County Prosecutor Kelly Ward on the case tonight, but I want to get to special guest detective Steve Hickey. He is the lead detective in Marcia's case. He is a detective with the Miami County, Ohio Sheriff's Office. All thank you for joining us tonight. I want to get to some of our case details. We know Marcia King was 21 when she died. She's from North Little Rock. She's found dead April 24th, 1981. She was strangled to death in Ohio. No one knew that it was Marcia until 2018 when detectives used that groundbreaking technology to ID her for years. Detectives in Ohio referred to her as the buckskin girl. I want to get to um, the lead detective on this case. That is Steve Hickey. Uh, detective, thank you for joining us tonight. Really appreciate it. Um, walk me through first, how did you guys come up with that name and where does the case stand tonight? Uh, she came up with that name, um, basically how she was found. Um, she was wearing a, a buckskin jacket um, and the, the locals, um, they pretty much stuck with that just because she was found by a local in our county. Um, and so that's how she got that name. Um, and it, it stuck with her through almost 37 years until we, we put a name with her. Um, uh, as of right now, uh, we are still tracking leads um, as far as uh, potential suspects. Um, we are doing that uh, forensically and also um, just with any tips that come in line into the sheriff's office. We know that she was found strangled to death. I want to uh, get to our panel tonight. Well, again, using the, the hashtag Monday Night Mystery, you're welcome to join in on our conversation. Uh, I want to get to Sergeant Thomas Cole. He's a major crimes detective. Sergeant, thanks for joining us tonight. What do you make out of the fact that Marcia was found strangled to death? We're also learning blunt force trauma. Yeah, that, that's pretty interesting. Um, obviously, strangulation is one of those you know, types of homicide that is very up close and very personal. Um, it's not like shooting someone from a distance. Um, to me, just personally, it feels even a little more personal than, um, you know, stabbing someone because it's not something that can just happen immediately and then you can back away. But you have to really have intent um, the, the entire time, you know, just a, just a moment of a second thought and, you know, you can stop in the middle of the act. So uh, to me, that says that there was something personal to this, whether it's because they knew each other or, uh, you know, they may have had some kind of interaction that caused a suspect to get angry um, or in some cases a suspect may have just been crazy and, and thought there was some reason that he needed to do it. Oh, and, and strangulation, uh, I, I want to get to Kelly Ward, former Pulaski County prosecutor. One could argue that this was more of a crime of passion than anything else. I mean, like Sergeant Thomas Cole was saying, I mean, you, you are right up front and close with the victim. It is. It's a very close, um, very violent act. Um, you see strangulation a lot in domestic violence cases. In fact, that's the most prevalent place that you'll see, or that I, my career, saw strangulation was in domestic violence uh, cases, domestic batteries, and domestic homicides, because it's that close, uh, intimate relationship um, that I guess you know, you described it as a crime of passion, but it's that emotion um, that can trigger that act of violence sometimes. But then other times you might just have, um, you know, someone who gets angry or it, it could just be a person who, um, you know, 
had an argument with her. We, d- we really don't know. But one thing we, it does tell us is that she died a very tragic, very violent death. Yeah, she did. And she deserves justice tonight. We are on the case, folks. Um, and, and I want to, there's just so much to get with this case, with, with this story. I want to get to a comment rolling in right now. Kada is using the, um, is, is asking any suspects in mind. Um, and Kelly, you were talking about when you were a prosecutor, uh, many of the cases that you would prosecute and specifically homicide, Mm-hmm. Uh, when strangulation is a cause of death is domestic violence cases. I want to get to Detective Steve Hickey, Miami County, Ohio Sheriff's Office. He's the lead detective on this murder. Um, detective, any idea on if Marcia and the suspect knew each other? Do we know that? Do you have a suspect? Uh, not this time, no. Um, you know, based on the victimology, we were able to tell that uh, she was a hitchhiker. Uh, she uh, did uh, hitchhike in semi trucks, other vehicles uh, to get to point A to point B quite frequently. Um, So, um, you know, she she met a lot of strangers. Um, You know, that's what we're still trying to work work out right now as far as, you know, who knew her um, and and if there was any personal, you know, whether a boyfriend or or someone relative that, you know, may have knew who she was hanging around with at that time. Um, And during the victimology, we we just haven't come up with um, a specific suspect that was close with her during that time. Uh, she was continuing hitchhiking. She was kind of, um, like I said, transient and just moving between states quite frequently. So, um, you know, is it possible she may have met someone uh, leading up to her death that she got close to? It's possible. Um, but, we, you know, we have a pretty specific timeline, um, approximately almost two weeks, uh, you know, uh, of her being alive um, and, and knowing where she was at during that time before um, she, uh, we recovered her body in, in Miami County. Detective Steve Hickey, Miami County, Ohio Sheriff's Office, the lead detective on Marcia's murder, um, giving us a, a kind of a, an inside look at what he is looking at in this uh, cold case homicide investigation. Um, let's paint the picture for, detec- uh, for, for folks, detective. Um, <clears throat> I've never been to Miami County, Ohio, apparently. The, the county seat, um, the major city in that area is Troy, Ohio. You say that there's about 106,000 residents there. Uh, there are three or four, uh, give or take uh, a few uh, unsolved homicides. So you guys have a pretty good clearance rate here. Um, but I, I want to ask you about this cult. Um, what do we know about this cult? Because apparently this cult has been brought up from time to time in Marcia's case. Walk me through that. Um, yeah, you know, cult, um, it, whether it's a, a following or a belief, um, it was pretty, uh, what we identified was pretty significant during um, her time of death. Uh, um, it, it's called the Way Ministries. Um, it is um, a ministry that is located uh, just north of our county, um, approximately about 25 minutes. Um, and we knew that during the, during the investigation that uh, she was tied to, to the Way International. Um, she actually took class and she was signed up. Um, and this is internationally. So, um, you know, they called themselves the Believers during that time. Um, there, were, there were numerous uh, contacts uh, that we have de- identified through the investigation where she has stayed and um, with family members in Kentucky and also uh, Pittsburgh specifically with the Believers. Um, and we also, um, believe that she was there in New Knoxville uh, prior to her death. So she, she knew how to, where it was. She's been there. Uh, and she, she was invested with the Way International. Okay, another good piece of information there. I want to get to Sergeant Thomas Cole. What do you make of all this? Well, it's, it's tough because um, there's, there's not a whole lot to go on. It doesn't seem like there's a a really obvious motive, um, as, as far as I know, and of course, uh, Detective Higgy can correct me, um, but it doesn't sound like she had any enemies um, or that she was you know, prone to making enemies. Uh, it seemed like she's a pretty nice person. Um, so it's always nice if you've got something to start with, like, you know, if the person was um, involved in, you know, crime or drugs or, you know, had an abusive partner or, you know, had any enemy uh, of any kind, but from, from everything I've read and seen, um, there's really just nothing like that. So it, it's very much 
um, kind of from the get go, it's almost a cold case because there just aren't that many clues. Uh, so yeah, this, this is a tough one. And, and I, I'm starting to kind of see why it may have taken so long for us to get where we are. Well, and it took so long just to ID her. What kind of setback does that create for the case? Kelly Ward, former Pulaski County prosecutor. Well, one of the things we always talk about for a victim um, in trying to investigate, solve, prosecute the crime is first you got to create that timeline. Who was the last person to see her? What was she doing? Uh, where was she going? Who was she going to be with? Was she going to travel by car? Was she, you know, all those details. And if you have an unidentified person, it makes it even uh, almost impossible to track down those little details about uh, the, the last days or last hours leading up to her death because you don't even have a name so you can't contact family members you can't contact mother aunt boyfriend um it's really just it starts out with no information i mean i assume they're going on forensics um where she was placed all that stuff and i'm sure that the detective will tell us that finding a name was was you know, a huge break um, cause that gives you a lot more information about the person, but it seemed to me, it seems like she might've been, um, at high risk because of her, her traveling, um, that she was, she traveled uh, by herself, you know, by through hitchhiking or on buses. And, um, that could have made her vulnerable to a stranger who, you know, might've saw an opportunity. Uh, I want to ask, the because you just mentioned something about uh, family, I, I want to ask the detective, what do we know about any family members that are still alive? Yeah, I, I had a chance to meet them. Um, you know, a lot of them uh, drove a flu here um, away when we had the, um, the news, um, you know, the press release of, of her identification. Um, you know, they were very sad, uh, you know, um, we were We've been in contact uh, with with her mom, uh, Bonnie King. Um, you know, Bonnie still lives in the same house. Um, basically, all Marcia since Marcia King has been missing. Uh, mom has always just hoped that she would just return home, um, so she never moved. Um, you know, they're they're very, uh, like I said, been cooperative. Um, a lot of the aunts and uncles that you know we've talked to, or cousins, um, you know, especially the you know she had some uh, cousins. Uh, in, in Louisville, Kentucky, um, we were able to talk to them. They were able to you know, add additional information to the timeline that we, we never knew until she was identified. So like Kelly Ward said, once we got the victimology, um, it, it opened a whole bunch of doors. Um, we, we could run a, you know, the history of this person, you know, um, where she's been, where she's lived, um, who she knew. Um, and, and just to be able to speak with the family gives us an idea of what kind of person uh, Marcia King was. Want to welcome folks in who are joining us tonight uh, uh, right here in Little Rock and of car across the country because we are on the case tonight for a North Little Rock woman who was strangled to death in Miami County, Ohio in 1981. She was 21 years old at the time of her death. I want to bring in a question coming in right now, and this is coming in from Lillian. Lillian, using the hashtag Monday Night Mystery, wants to know, did the autopsy reveal if she was pregnant? or not? Detective? Uh, no, um, the autopsy did reveal that she, she was not pregnant or did any um, signs of, of ever being pregnant. So, Not pregnant. Um, and then there's also a question coming in now um, about from Cynthia wondering if there's some kind of reward for information leading to an arrest or suspect. We, we have not put out a reward. Um, you know, I think if, if um, I think we've been pretty successful with media attention um, uh, through our, our local outlets and even and that nationwide, uh, especially since we identified her and, and how we identified her. It got a lot of media attention uh, through the nation. We, we got a lot of calls. So, um, you know, until we get um, maybe further information, of, if, if we get a, a person of interest and we're looking for that person, uh, you know, and maybe we want information where that person may be um, for questioning or um, for an arrest, and maybe we, we may um, uh, entertain an award at that, that time. But there's no award as of right now. Sergeant Thomas Cole, major crimes detective, pros and cons of a, uh, offering a reward. Sure, well, it, it's 
it's almost the same thing. A lot of times the, the pro and the con both can just be that um, you, you tend to get information come in. And so whether that's a pro or a con depends on kind of how good that information is. Um, you, you may have someone who has some information, but it's just never really been motivated to come forward. And certainly a reward might, might be that thing that um, kind of pushes them over the edge of wanting to come forward. On the flip side, you may have folks who, just want a chance at a reward and may you know come forward with information that's not as good or you know in some cases even information that's made up um, the detectives especially on a cold case like this they have to follow every one of those leads and while they can certainly you know, kind of triage it and take the leads that seem the most likely to produce results uh, at some point they're going to have to follow all of those tips that come in so in, in some cases, it can give you just exactly what you need, but in some cases, a reward can kind of cause a, a flood of new information that sends you kind of on wild goose chases. And it's not always easy to kind of sort that out right at the beginning. You have to actually put the legwork in to see you know, whether that lead is going to actually lead you anywhere useful. But I, I also want to throw in, I, I've heard that <clears throat> offering a reward can also um, put the case um, it's in terms of that critical tip that, that an investigator might need in jeopardy because the person who has that information will hold on it, wait to see if the reward goes up. Is that true? So I haven't personally had any cases like that, but I would not be surprised, uh, especially uh, it's it is really common for uh, an initial uh, reward to be offered and then uh, sometimes other groups may become aware of it and they may throw some money into that pot um, we've had that certainly happen and sometimes you know a reward might might start here and it may double after a couple of months because other other groups with money set aside for that kind of thing might uh, might pitch in on it so you know i wouldn't be shocked to find out that that could happen kelly or no. um detective hickey have you guys seen it like that before? Kelly, I thought you were going to start talking. I was. Uh, I was just going to say, I have not seen that. But one thing um, I always, you know, you got to be mindful of when you're prosecuting a case um, is that rewards can give you good information. They can somehow sometimes break a case, but they also bring some baggage for your witnesses um that they've got that's just a ready-made um thing that a defense attorney can impeach the witness with if the witness ends up testifying at the trial if it's you know your main witness or a good uh, corroborating witness um, they have given information uh, in order to get some type of money so that while it can be really good to get um information and maybe solve the case it can also um um, it can be difficult in court um, if that person does end up having to testify. Detective Hickey? Yeah, I, I agree. Um, you know, just based off the media attention we, we initially got, um, you know, we got, uh, the sheriff's office got flooded, and I'm thankful, but we got flooded with phone calls um, about information. And, and just like uh, Mr. Cole said that, you know, you have to track down a lot of those leads um, and, and try to see if there's any truth behind it. Um, and that takes a lot of time. Um, so we, we you know, like I, I, I agree with both um, Kelly and Thomas on this, you know, it, there's two sides to it. Um, but I think as of right now, I think unless, unless we absolutely have to, um, and it's, again, it's ultimately up to the sheriff what he wants to do. Um, but uh, you know, I think if, if we absolutely had to, um, we may entertain it. But I, we, since I've worked here uh, for 13 years, um, I haven't seen an award, uh, award or, or anything of such nature. We've, we've been pretty successful in our cases, and and I believe we're going to be successful in this one. Well, and you were just telling us that you guys were getting tips, even just over the weekend. I mean, this case is still. Um, I won't want to say hot. It's obviously a cold case. The case is still very active. Absolutely. Um, you know, we, we always we have an anonymous tip line. Um, you know, we we welcome any type of tips and in, involved or involving in this case. Um, you know, initially when we 1981, you know, we, we thought maybe she was local. Um, so a lot of the local tips over the years, um, you know, have been they kind of exhausted um, in, a, in a good term. Um, 
but you know, we locally we always give um, the the uh, media or local media attention the the case just to remind everybody that this is you know we're still working it. Uh, any new information we did that every single year, um, or focusing focusing around April of April every year. Um, so you know, through throughout the years, you know, we we've worked on numerous tips. Um, and detectives way before me who, who handled this case, you know, we, you know, I've received some, I've talked to the same people um, that, you know, in 1981 they've talked to, you know, so it, it's, you know, I get, like I said, you, the tips are great, um, it, but like I said, there's a lot of work on the, on the back end of it, but you know, we're, we're ready for it. Um, we're going to track down the leads, um, make sure um, there's truth to it, and we'll follow up with it. And, and get this person to justice, absolutely. Detective Steve Hickey from the Miami County, Ohio Sheriff's Office joining us live tonight on Monday Night Mystery. We're talking about the cold case murder of uh, Marcia King. It happened in 1981. Uh, Marcia was traveling to um, Ohio and she was found dead uh, there in um, Miami, Miami County, Ohio, which is also in the city of Troy. Um, so, I'm, I'm looking back, I'm looking at um, some research on this story here, uh, and, and I guess there was a murder of a 27-year-old woman two months earlier, um, and that was in February of 1981. Um, I guess you, have you guys ever linked those murders? Yeah, it, like I said, when, when those, initially when we um, received this, homicide case, I mean, they made connections, they, they talked to other jurisdictions, they've tried to make um, connections to, um, you know, other agencies, cases as far as, you know, how their, their victim, uh, the cause of death, if there's any similarities, maybe potential the same suspects, if they had suspects, um, you know, the, we've worked through numerous agencies over the years just to see if there's any connections and even up to the level where uh, the FBI uh, was was including um, some of our cases with with serial killers, um, and they were trying to make connections that way. Um, but at this time, we we have not uh, made a specific connection to a, another agency's case. But that homicide case is still open, right? Uh, I believe so. Uh, I'm not. Do you know where which county that was out of? I'm. I, you broke up there. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, do you know what, what case you're specifically referring to? Because there is, I don't I, in, Just in, in the research I have here, um, it, it just says the murder of, of a woman two months earlier, 1981. Um, and so um, um, I, I don't, but long story short, the cases are not connected as of yet. Um, okay, so walk me through as we wrap up here. Um, how did you guys ultimately make the... Um, identification of Marcia King to be Marcia and talk to me about the previous work you guys did to ID her. I know that you guys invested a ton of resources and money into it. Yeah, um, so um, I got, um, I've been on with the Sheriff's Office since 2013 um, and um, as far as uh, being a detective, uh, I was assigned specifically in, in 2013 so um when i received the case i you know i go back and see what work has been done uh so you know dna uh wasn't um pop, you know wasn't even thought of in 1981 up in, until the, the earlier mid 90s is when that started to, to launch so you know throughout the years you know we we uploaded her dna um into, into to codis um you know any um dental work records, uh, anything like that we, we went through. So when I reviewed the case, I, I found that um, she was in um, Nas National Center of Missing and Exploited Children. And in 2010, uh, she was taken out. Um, and when I made the phone call to um, National Center of Missing and Exploited Children, that kind of opened the doors for, for me um, and, and, and the other detectives working the case. Um, they were uh, they reopened the case and they provided um, different avenues forensically what we could do and test. And that um, that happened in 2016. Uh, we were able to send uh, her clothes 
um, to uh, U.S. Boards and Customs down in Texas for pollen testing um, to see what, uh, what pollen was on her clothes, and they were able to break it down as far as what region where she was at. Again, we have no idea where she's from or, or anything. So we were trying to think of anything where we could try to pinpoint where she spent most of her time. And then uh, we also sent uh, her hair um, to ISO Forensics in Utah. They were um, able to test the, the hair uh, for, for drinking water and uh, the hair strain of your hair kind of um, gives a, a timeline of what drinking water or what water you were drinking during the time uh, per se through a year worth and they were able to actually pinpoint that she was in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, specific drinking water there was found in her hair. So um, as even her clothes had uh, pollen from uh, the Texas area and as far as the Northeast area as well. So we we knew that she was down south at some point um, and she kind of traveled kind of uh, diagonal uh, through the northeast, uh, what we were seeing through through those um, uh, results. Um, the the key break to this case uh, was in 2018. Uh, we were able uh, through a hepatitis two, we were able to send her blood uh, for uh, DNA uh, testing through uh, forensic genealogy. Um, so genealogy kind of um, like uh, they. As far as Ancestry.com, um, GEDmatch, stuff like that, um, they didn't specifically do it, but we we're able to send it to um, a genealogy forensic um, company where they were able to uh, get DNA from her blood and extract that and was able to upload that into a genealogy system. And through that, we were able to link uh, her DNA um, through a family member. And through that family member tree, we came across her um, and it said on her family, family tree, she was presumed dead. Uh, so that, that was uh, obviously a light bulb and you know, who is she and why is she presumed dead? So I kind of backtracked. Um, we were able to uh, identify um, her mother um, and then we contacted locals in Arkansas who were able to uh, collect um, Marcia King's mother's DNA, um, and which was um, sent to Ohio, where um, our victim's DNA and mother's DNA was directly compared to our local lab. And it, was, uh, it was a match, and then she was positively identified. Wow, I, I'm that that's uh, Sergeant Thomas. Call I guess uh, your feedback. Uh, I mean, wow. Yeah, that, that's awesome. And this is really kind of a new, I guess, avenue that is available to law enforcement just in the last few years. And uh, if, the, if they were on top of this in 2018, uh, you know, I would say they're pretty much on the cutting edge of that. So that that's really impressive and definitely kind of speaks to the amount of effort and just kind of the, the outside the box thinking, because honestly, looking into that, um, kind of genealogy stuff is still in a lot of places. It still is outside the box thinking, and that's that's where they were back in 2018. So um, I, I find that just as an investigator to be pretty impressive, uh, and obviously it turned into some great results for them, um, for them to be able to you know identify someone, you know, 27 years uh, later. It's just really impressive. Kelly Ward, what are your thoughts? Very impressive, and one thing that strikes me is that. Here's a, a case from 1981, and I believe, um, you know, 40 years ago, uh, probably a lot of the people at the sheriff's office probably may not have even been born yet, uh, but they're working tirelessly on this case still in 2018, 2021. And so I think that really speaks to, um, you know, their dedication to the case and to solving uh, these types of cases for victims. And that's one thing that a lot of people don't know is that um, even though it may seem like a case is old or it's from, you know, 20 or 20 years ago, 30 years ago, it's people are still working on it. You've even got new generation of law enforcement that are continually working on it. They went to, I think he mentioned at least four different labs around the country um, just to try to identify her. So it, it's just, it's really impressive, um, the lengths and the dedication that they've put into this case. 
Yeah, it's so impressive. Um, Detective Steve Hickey, you know, our hat's off to you as you guys continue to try and bring justice um, for Marcia King. Um, I know that this case is, is not going away. It's on your desk. There are active leads on it. Um, if anybody has information regarding the homicide of Marcia King, you are asked uh, to contact the, Mar or the uh, Miami County, Ohio Sheriff's Office. You can speak to the lead detective there, Steve Hickey, um, as they continue to work this case. Detective, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you very much. Kelly Ward, former Pulaski County Prosecutor, also Sergeant Thomas Cole, thank you for your time tonight. We really appreciate it and your expertise. This has been Monday Night Mystery. We're back next week with a new episode. And of course, the mysteries continue on krk.com and fox16.com. For now, have a good rest of your night. And again, if you have any information about who killed Marcia King, call the Miami County Ohio Sheriff's Office.